Hello everybody, Lethal Frag here. We're back for another episode of Cooking with Frag. Thank you everybody for the support the Patreon to make this content possible. We're going to be going over knife skills and kitchen tips today. My very first episode of Cooking with Frag ever was a knife skills episode. Uh, I was much more inexperienced at the time for live production. And I want to go over the key elements of how to use your knife and also talk about some of the tips and tricks around the kitchen that will have you cooking more effectively and leave you with less mess to clean up at the end of the day. We're going to hop right over to the cutting board and start talking about knives, steels, and then we'll start chopping some stuff. Okay, so here we have our knife and our steel. These two things go together. If you own a good knife, you need to own a steel. What a steel does is removes the micro abrasions on the edge of your knife. Each time you make a, a rolling motion with your knife, you end up leaving a, a little micro abrasion on the blade. And what the steel does is smooths those out. So every time you use your knife, you should steal it. It'll keep it sharper for longer, and uh, it just makes your knife safer. The adage is, a sharp knife is a safe knife. That may seem silly, but with a sharp knife, you're never going to slip and cut yourself. Okay, so a little trick with the steel is, most steels have this beveled edge. And what you're looking for here is the short edge. If you rest your knife up against the edge like this, you have the perfect angle to steal your knife. So if you're stealing your knife for the first time, place your steel directly down the cutting board, press it up against, and then just drag it down. Think about how much pressure it takes to push a button on a controller. Not very much. You don't need to s slam the knife in there. And then when you're more experienced, you can take it off, off the cutting board and do it like this. When you're first getting started, just do a slow motion. Rest it up against the steel and bring it down in a smooth motion. You want to cover every edge of the blade and start on the back and move your way all the way up to the top. Once you're done stealing your blade, you do want to wipe it with a towel. It will leave some uh, metal residue, either from the steel or your knife. That is basic knife care. That's not how you sharpen a knife. This is not a sharpening tool. This is a honing tool. It'll keep your knife sharper longer. It will not make it sharper than it actually is. Um, seen a lot of people working in kitchens try to use these to sharpen their knife. This is not a sharpening tool. However, it's one of the most important things you can have in the kitchen. I always say the most important piece of equipment you can have is a good knife. The second most pe important piece of equipment you can have is a good steel. So let's talk about the basics of setting up a cutting station. One thing you want is a dry towel. The other thing you want is a wet towel underneath your cutting board. Always start by putting a wet towel underneath your cutting board. This will keep your cutting board from slipping at all. A slipping cutting board is one of the easiest ways to cut yourself in the kitchen, and putting a damp towel under there uh, removes that possibility. I've worked with a lot of people that don't like to put towels under their cutting board, and the question that I ask them, what is the first thing that you have to do when you're done using your cutting board? You have to clean up. So having this damp towel underneath your cutting board, you're just setting yourself up for success. Because the first thing you're going to have to do is wipe down your counter anyways. You're going to need this later, so use it for safety now. Okay, we're going to go over uh, how to grip your knife now. This is very important. See, a lot of people misuse their knife and not grip it right. All right, so what you do is you wrap your bottom three fingers around the blade, grab on pretty tightly, and then you pinch with your finger and your thumb. The grip on your knife should never change while you're cutting. It should always remain this. You should not be trying to move the knife to get a better angle or wiggling the knife back and forth. All the action for cutting is in your wrist. This is, this is what makes cutting possible. You gotta have a nice solid grip. A nice solid grip will also keep you from cutting yourself, but all the motions in your wrist, your hand and your grip never changes. So once again, you lay your knife out flat, wrap three fingers around, and then pinch. It should settle into your palm pretty nicely, but you never change, you never change your grip. You wanna pinch uh, specifically right here very hard. That's how you can get the firmest grip possible. So now we're gonna go over something pretty basic, which is how to cut an onion. I find that a lot of people are afraid of cooking because they think they don't know how to. All you have to do is go slow. There is no time competition. You're not a professional kitchen. All you have to do is take your time and do it right. All right. So to cut an onion, you just cut off each side. What this does is gives you a flat surface. You'll notice this is a theme with cutting things. You want to make a flat surface so that your item is not rolling around. Then we're going to cut it in half and then just peel off the outer layer. If you have a weird onion with a weird skin, you can just pull off the entire outer edge. It does make a little more waste, but it can save some time, and if it's all, uh, it's weird, you'll know it. So we'll do that on this one. It's not weird, but you can just take your thumb and pull and push underneath the first layer of onion. Nice and easy. 
Now there's two ways to cut an onion. I'm going to recommend the not hard way. Now, uh, if you're working in a kitchen, a lot of people will want you to do it the hard way because it makes a slightly nicer dice, but uh, frankly, it's an onion. Okay. First things first when you're cutting anything is you want to make a claw with your hand. You make a claw like this. The goal of making the claw is to make it so your top knuckle is the furthest extruded point on your hand. The reason that you do this is when you put your claw on your food, you're able to slide the knife safely down. There's no, if you go like this, it's very easy to cut your finger. If you stick your thumb out like this, very easy to cut your thumb. I have cut myself on onions more commonly than any other food in the kitchen. I would say at least 40% of my cuts came off of cutting onions. So we're going to try not to do that now. Okay. So to cut an onion the correct way, what you do is you make a half, you place it on the cutting board, and you take your hand and spread it out and pull your fingers all the way back. Put your palm down on the onion, and then we're going to go in a slicing motion and make slices this way. You go almost through the onion, about 80%. Once again, keeping your hand and your fingers up at all times. Okay, so now that we have the grooves done this way, we're going to cut into the onion the other way. This will make the most consistent dice on your onion, but I find it to be horribly unnecessary for home cooking. However, I wanted to demonstrate the proper way to do it because that's how a lot of people tell you to. Then you just come down this way, and you got a nicely diced onion. All right. So you can deal with these ends however you want. I'm not going to touch those right now, but usually you just dice them up. So you can see we got a pretty uh, even. That's a pretty big dice, but you can make your uh, slots this way a lot smaller, and your cuts this way a lot smaller too. Now, the way I see it, onions already have this really nice circular ring inside of them. So I usually just skip doing this step because it's the most dangerous step. Make your claw and just come down this way. We'll go a little bit smaller on this one. Now, I'm going pretty slow here because, uh, one, I don't want to cut myself. And two, I want to make sure you guys see what's going on. So here what I'm doing is I'm pinching the onion like this sticking the knife in, and then pushing down. Uh, never angling the knife down towards my thumb. Even safer is to put your hand completely on the other side. Now, the big thing here is if you have a sharp knife, your knife's gonna, not going to slip. If you have a really dull knife and you're trying to do this, a very good possibility your knife's going to slip down and cut yourself. So the sharper your knife is, the better. So there's some pretty nicely diced onion. Uh, it's a little more inconsistent when you do it that way, but once again, it's onion. And if you need super finely diced onion, you can do it the fancy way. If not, it's kind of hard to even tell the difference. So there's a nice little chop. And we'll put these in a container for later. I have trained a lot of people in kitchens, and uh, I don't think that inherent cooking skill is the most important thing when learning how to cook. It's the desire to learn. I have trained a lot of people that were experienced in the kitchen that were very poor at learning because they were set in their ways. And I've also trained a lot of people that were completely green that uh, really caught on to it because they were eager to, eager to learn. Uh, being excited about cooking is the most important thing. You don't have to go fast. You can go as slow as you want and do it just perfectly. In fact, if you're just learning how to use a knife, I highly encourage you to go very slow with it. Uh, one, there's less risk of cutting yourself, and two, you're going to understand how to do that faster. Using a knife is really all about repetition. The more repetitions you get in, the faster and more consistent you are with the knife. So when you're first beginning, it's not important to be fast. It's important to know how to do it right. You'll see I'm wiping off my blade here, and then we're going to steal it since we just did something. If you give your knife a couple hits over the steel each time you use it, it'll pretty much stay sharp forever. Let's talk about some bad stuff you can do with your knife when you're cutting. This noise is not good. You should never use your knife to slide over food. Um, if you're going to do that, just <laughs> be very gentle, because that's a good way to dull out your knife. Also, chopping like this while fast, is also very bad for the edge of your knife. The best thing you can do is either drag it or roll it. Those are the two best techniques. All right, now we're going to talk about how to peel a pineapple. 
So it's pretty much the same thing you do with all fruit. We're going to do the exact same thing with a watermelon here in a second. But uh, fruit can be pretty intimidating. You've got whole, whole fruits like watermelon, cantaloupe. You're like, where do I even start? I didn't know where to start until I started working in the kitchen, and they show you. So we're going to cut off the ends once again to make a flat surface for ourselves. There we go. I was a little bit off on this one. It's kind of uh, skewed, you can see. Now what you're going to do is take the knife and remove the outside skin. You're going to use mostly the back end of the knife here. This gives you the most leverage with your grip, especially on something with a pineapple that has a uh, thicker, uh, thicker outside. Okay, so the basic motion here is not just to cut straight down. You're cutting out and then around, out and then around. So you make a small cut out and then pull the knife back in. And you just take a little bit off at a time. You can do it in as many segments as you want to. The smaller segments you do, the more control you're going to have and the less waste. If you try to take a really big chunk off like this, you end up with more waste and then you're going to have to come back and trim like this. I'm going to press down pretty firmly on the pineapple to make sure it's not going to shake around or slide fruit is inherently quite slippery. Put this in the waste bin. Okay. I'll go over this one more time, but I want to tell you guys the biggest trick I ever learned in a kitchen, and I figured this out by myself, if you're right-handed, put everything you're doing on the left side of your cutting board. The reason you do this is each time you make a cut on something, it's ending up on the right side of your knife. So if you have all of your things over here, and then I go to cut, it's ending up on the same side, and there's a wasted motion of pushing the food back over to the left-hand side of your cutting board. All right, this one needs a little trimming. All right, to core a pineapple, very simply, uh, place it here, and then make a small diagonal cut like that. Kind of the same premise as a uh, onion. You want to keep your hand up and away from the blade. These pineapple cores are fine to eat. They're fine in like smoothies and stuff. They just have a more woody texture than the rest of the pineapple, which is why they're usually discarded. All right, now for cutting fruit. Oh, I'll point out one more thing. No matter how much you're doing on the cutting board, do one process at a time. So you see here, I made it into quarters, removed the cores all at once, and now we're going to slice it all at once. If you have a very large cutting project, this is extremely important. If you're cutting mushrooms in half and then slicing them, cut all of your mushrooms in half first, move them to the side, and then slice them all. If you end up doing one at a time, there's a lot of wasted motion, a lot of wasted energy. That goes for any, any cutting task. Put everything on the left side of your cutting board and do one process at a time. So if I wanted to cut these in half and I had 55 pineapple uh, quarters, I would make them all like this, then I'd cut them all in half, then I'd slide them back over, and then I'd do whatever I was going to do next. Slicing fruit is all the same. It's one of the unique knife motions you don't usually use, which is the drag. So you place the tip of the knife on the cutting board, make your claw, and drag the knife through. You cut pretty much all fruit this way, and the reason for it is, if you end up going like this, you see what happens? Your pineapple catches on the blade and becomes a huge mess. So we just hold and drag through. I want to do a pineapple because this really does demonstrate, the, I think, the fruit cutting the best. You, if you have a little duller knife, you can start a cut by going in a little bit and then pulling it through. That works too. When you work in kitchens, they have knives there, and they often become dull, so you have to find new and creative ways to make cuts work, especially on things like tomatoes and bell peppers. So I'll go a little faster now. I've probably made 1,500 fruit trays in my career in the kitchen. I was always the fruit tray guy. And the chopping guy, uh, another guy I worked with, Tyler, was extremely good with knife skills, but he was always busy doing management stuff, so they always left the really uh, tedious chopping task to me, which was perfectly fine by myself. Okay. Yeah, another reason you do the last cut, you don't have this uh, extra stuff left over in uneven piles. 
And now you can simply just slide the knife under and move it to whatever container you want. We're just going to use a bowl here, which we'll wrap up in a minute. Safest is, of course, a spatula, but I'm comfortable doing this with my knife. All right, now we got a mess on our cutting board. So what we're going to go ahead and do is give it a quick, quick rinse under the sink, and then we'll move on to our next project. A messy cutting boarding is also dangerous. All this fruit juice is very slippery. So if we go to try to cut other stuff on this cutting board, uh, the risk of cutting ourselves is increased. Well, that's nothing a little water won't fix. After we get our cutting board uh, wet, we want to go back over with the dry towel and wipe it off. So it's a clean, dry surface. It's non-slip. Doesn't have to be perfectly dry, but you definitely don't want it to be wet. All right, so now we're going to do a watermelon, which is basically the same thing. I think you probably mostly commonly see watermelon be uh, cut into triangles, which we're going to do here. We're going to remove the skin. So same deal. We're going to go here. We're going to cut off one end. Then we're going to cut off the other, which will leave us a nice flat surface. You always want a flat surface if you can. That's always preferred because it's the safest. If you're trying to cut the watermelon like this, you can see it's very unstable. And if you're having your hand on it and trying to cut down, you're probably going to have a bad time. Or you will eventually have a bad time. Uh, I've certainly developed some bad habits when I worked in kitchens that I've had to work pretty hard to, to change. Because if you don't, you're going to hurt yourself. So same deal here. Watermelon's much easier to peel than pineapple. Once again, the motion goes. We're going to make a cut down, pull the knife in, and around down, in, and around. So your first cut's pretty sharp, and then you work on angling the knife after that. That wasn't a very good one. The first one's always the hardest. Once you get the uh, second and third in, you're working on a smaller plane, which makes it easier. I can tell you right now I already fudged this one, but that's okay. We can go back and fix it. Your goal is to have as little red on these peels as possible, but at the same time, the white uh, rind of the pineapple is pretty bitter, so you want to get rid of it all. So, you can see here, I didn't do a very good job peeling that end. I think the best option is to work from the bottom. It's going to be safer than flipping it over. So we'll just go back through a couple of these. Trim it off. And you know, it's really, it's okay to make mistakes when you cut stuff. I mean, I worked in kitchens for seven years, but I certainly don't cook every day. Uh, Ashley's nice enough to do a lot of uh, the on-stream cooking and stuff like that. So, uh, just because you mess up doesn't mean that you're bad. Mistakes happen every day in the professional kitchen. Every single day, mistakes are made. Okay, so if you have any leftover you don't like, just come back and kind of just shave it off like this. Okay. Now, our flat surface is a little bit sketchy because it's a lot smaller now that the rind's not there. So you guessed it, we're going to cut this in half, which leaves us a nice flat cutting surface. Finding the flat cutting surface is probably the most important part about knife safety. Okay, you got a couple options here. You can cut down like you would an onion and make dices out of it. We're just going to make triangles out of this. So we're going to cut in half one more time and then pull the knife through. When you're making your claw, the most important, the, the, best, the easiest way to cut yourself is to let your thumb slide out like this. You always got to be conscious to pull your thumb back so it's not going above your knuckles. Uh, that's c most commonly how I cut myself on onions. You're making the claw, you get lazy, your thumb slides up, and then bam, you're done. All right, let's put this in a bowl. Yeah, I did. There we go. You'll notice if you do everything in these nice little things, it's really easy to pick up and put where you want it. That bowl may not be big enough. Okay. 
So that's how to peel and cut fruit. Uh, I guess there's a couple exceptions to that. Not with the actual technique, but let's say you're doing a cantaloupe. What you have to do is you do the exact same thing. You peel it completely, cut it in half, and then you just scoop out the seeds with a spoon. Uh, cantaloupe, honeydew, and other seeded uh, melons work, that, work like that. You just have to scrape out the inside with a spoon and then cut it like normal. Just going to give this a quick wipe down. All right, what is the best way to practice your knife skills? Russet potatoes. They're cheap. They cut really nice. And uh, malformed potatoes make fine in a hash. It's not a, not a big deal. Okay, so we're going to go over a couple of the basic cuts that you commonly see in kitchens. And if you want to get fancy, you can do it at home. We're going to go over julienne's, which is like matchstick cut, and then uh, like small and medium dice. So if you need to get a specific cut out of anything, you must make a square first. So we're going to cut off the ends. And then we're going to make a square out of this potato. So the hardest cut's always going to be the first one to get straight because you're on a rolly surface. So we're going to push it down pretty hard in the cutting board and try to make a straight angular cut. We push down with the knife like we're doing a roll. Now we have our flat surface to work with and it becomes much easier. All of the action and cutting is in the wrist. Uh, once again, you never want to change your grip on a knife to try to, uh, to try to make it easier to cut. It's all in the wrist. That's all the motion you need. So this may seem like a lot of leftovers, but it is. But when I had my knife, uh, knife tutorial or knife, um, knife test in culinary school, this is definitely it. You'll notice when you cut potatoes too, you end up with a lot of starch on the knife. This is actually pretty important to wipe after about every fourth or fifth cut. The starch will make it sticky and make it a lot harder to cut uh, with your knife. You can also keep a pitcher of water next to it to dip your knife in, but wiping it with a dry towel works just fine. Now, of course, these won't be perfect, but we're going to look at what we have here. We're going to try to make this into cubes. So I'm going to look at this and say, okay, we're going to get four, four plates off of this. One, two... Three, four. Ooh, that was a little off. So now we have these. Now we're going to look at dice and say, well, I'm going to get two out of this to actually make a cube. A little trick you can do if you're on something sticky like potatoes, if you stick your finger over the other side, then pull the knife up. Uh, it'll stop it from pulling the sticks. And then we're just going to go in what we think is good cubes. And there you have really nicely cubed potatoes. Perfect for potato hash or uh, whatever else. All right, now we're going to say this one's a little skinnier. I'm going to go for julienne's, which are matchsticks. There's a very specific um, requirement for doing julienne's, but uh, I'm a home cook. So we just go much thinner. These are actually a little bit off, but that's okay. And cut these in half, and then we have matchsticks instead. You can see here that they're a little bit, uh, they're not quite square. They're more of a rectangle, but that's okay. Maybe on the next one. If you want to do a larger dice, you just do the exact same thing. You basically cut that thing in half, um, whatever you can make a cube out of. Okay, we'll do this potato too, and then we'll move on. So once again, we're going to make our claw push pretty hard down on it so we can get a nice even surface. The first cut is always the most important. I'm going to trim the ends off after the fact here. This may seem kind of wasteful, and in a way it is, but if you need practice, it's a cheap way to do it. You can make uh, like potato skins out of these. All right, so now we're going to go for a larger dice. So we're going to go for getting three out of this instead of four. And then we're just going to cut this in well, threes again. I find smaller dices are a lot easier to do than larger dices myself. But that is the basic premise for making any shape, is first square off what you want, and then dice it down from there. All right, these can go in here. OK.
If you want to cut potatoes ahead of time, uh, definitely put them in water. Russets especially turn um, rusty quite fast. It's an interesting note, uh, oxidized potatoes or uh, you know, rusty looking food or even brown avocado taste exactly the same as the normal looking variant. It just looks gross. There's actually no taste difference between oxidized potatoes, oxidized avocado. It's just your brain telling you that it looks disgusting. Give our knife a nice wipe. We'll wipe off our cutting board too. See what else I have to do here. Let's go over green onion. If I can find it, I forgot to pull it out. There it is. This will be a good example of a precision cut. And then we'll, uh, I'll talk about whitefish, which is one of the questions on the Patreon. And then I'll field a couple questions. My main goal of this segment is to give people a better understanding of how to use a knife. And that it's actually not that scary to cut stuff. I think fear is probably the greatest factor in people not wanting to cook. They think they're going to mess up. They don't know how to cut stuff. They think they're going to cut themselves, you know, whatever. When in reality, it's not all that scary. So green onions are a beautiful ingredient, and these are quite nice. Um, there's two parts of the green onion. There's the white. This is very good for sautéing. And then there's the green, which is what we normally see as garnish. The green has a lot more flavor packed into it. So if you're going for garnish, you usually go down to about about here on it, where it just starts turning more white than green. Uh, same thing goes for leeks, which just look like a giant version of green onions. The difference between a green onion and a leek is that the green portion of the leek is almost inedible. You can only really use the white. Okay, so we're going to trim off the ends here. The ends are always a little bit yucky. We'll cut off the end here. All right, there's a couple different ways you can chop green onions. The normal way you normally see people do is you make your claw and then you just make rings out of it. So what I'm kind of doing here is just moving my, my hands back like that, but you keep your knuckles being the top edge and you just kind of scoot your hand down like that. Takes some practice to get used to. There's absolutely nothing wrong with placing your hand, making one cut, replacing your hand, making another cut. That'd definitely be the preferred way to do it if you're new, uh, new to it. But it'll become natural to you to move your hand as you're cutting the more practice you get. My favorite way to cut green onions is on a severe bias. So when we say bias, you know what we were cutting like this. We're going to make a bias with the knife like this. Same deal. You see we make our claw, but it's at an angle now rather than being uh, straight on. The reason I like cutting green onions like this so much is it's a much whiter piece of green onion, which hits your tongue a lot nicer than the rings. I also find these hold up a lot better if you're going to cook them. And they also look really pretty. Like that looks infinitely better than this, in my opinion. When you get down to the white of the onion, you can go from the other side, and usually you just make rings out of these, and you can throw them in the pan when you're cooking. They're very fragrant, very flavorful. Um, but they're more subtle than the actual green of the onion. You can actually hear my knife catching on the skin of the onion. We're going to do a little test here. I'm going to steal my knife, which I didn't do after the last thing, and then we're going to do that again, and I'll bet you won't hear that noise. Give it a quick wipe so there's no metal fragments. These metal fragments will not hurt anybody, but I don't really want them in my food. Oh yeah, smooth as butter. So that is the three uses for green onion. You can cut them on a severe bias, which is my preference. You can cut them in circles, or you can use the whites for sauteing. Okay, I want to talk very quickly about whitefish. Somebody asked the best way to cook whitefish is one of the uh, questions to be answered in this episode. Whitefish, uh, by definition, is a very mild flavor. There's not a lot going on with whitefish. So what you got to be careful of with whitefish is that you don't overpower the natural flavor of the fish. Ways you can overpower the natural flavor of the fish is by oversalting it. Uh, using too much fat to cook it, although beurre blanc sauces are classic with whitefish, you're really going to lose the fish in that sauce in most occasions. 
The best way to cook white fish, in my opinion, is just take a nice hot pan, sear it real quick on one side, flip it over for about 30 seconds, put it on the plate, lemon, salt, and pepper. There's so many different ways you can go with white fish as far as uh, cream sauces, beurre blanc, all that. But really, the star of the plate should be your fish at the end of the day is how I feel. If you want to get extravagant after that, go for it. But unless you know what the piece of white fish tastes like just by itself with lemon, salt, and pepper, it's going to be hard to make an accompanying sauce. This is definitely something that's very important in cooking is understanding flavors. If you haven't eaten something raw and then something cooked and then something prepared with something else, you don't understand the full depth of what you're eating. There's certainly occasions that's not possible, but if you have the opportunity to try your food raw, not meat, obviously, uh, try your food raw, then try it cooked, and then try it um, a different preparation, you're going to have a much better understanding of the whole flavor profile of what you're cooking. All right, I think that's going to do it for the uh, knife skills and kitchen tips. Let's go over quickly what we talked about. We talked about how to grip our knife. We talked about how to steal our knife. We talked about how to peel and cut fruit, how to make cubes out of food. We talked about how to cut a green onion, how to cut a normal onion. And some of the key tips that we went over were um, always keep everything on the left side of your cutting board if you're cutting and you're right-handed. That's obviously opposite if you're left-handed. Do one task at a time. Meaning if you have an order of operations, like if I need to peel five watermelons, I don't peel and cut one watermelon, peel and cut another. We peel all watermelons, then cut all watermelons. Um, oh yeah, another question that was on there that I should go over real quick. What do you need to start in the kitchen? The only thing you really need to start cooking is one decent pot, one decent saute pan, a decent knife, and a cutting board. Those are the only tools you ever need. They sell knives, they sell fillet knives, paring knives, uh, boning knives, scissors, all these other kitchen tools. But you can do everything with this knife right here if you're slow and you take it careful. Certainly some knives are better at other jobs than others, but you do not need a $500 knife kit to be a good cook. You need one good knife, a steel, a cutting board, one pot, and one saute pan. I'm right, going to answer a few questions here, and then we will uh, head on into gaming content. Cool. Okay, I'm just going to move the monitor over here real quick so I can, uh, I can read it while we go. Ashley is nice enough to uh, go to those. Well, thank you. Yoitz, Yoitz Hobbles, Goldie Len Lenovo, Biohazard, E. Griffin, Zaloth, Belial, Acratio, Awesome Guy You Know, and Soul Sticks for the sub support. For a beginner, would you recommend one or two very good knives for a block of lesser quality knives? I would really recommend the one good quality knife and take care of it. The best thing you can do for your knife is each time you use it, uh, clean it and then immediately dry it with a nice towel. Uh, the drier your knife is after you're cleaning it, the better. Just never leave your knife wet. If you do that, I've had that knife I'm using on stream for over a decade now, and it's still in great shape. When keeping fresh fruit, do you guys just put it in a bowl? That's a good question. Uh, often we'll put paper towels in the bottom of the bowl that'll help soak up some of the juices and keep the fruit uh, a bit better. But the shelf life on cut fruit is not very high. It's not something you want to do a week ahead of time, the day of or the day before. What's the difference between a saute pan and a regular nonstick pan? There's not really a difference. That is a saute pan. Um, you're looking for something that's moderately thick and that'll hold heat okay, but you really only need one good one. So your particular cutting board material that's best for knife blade lifetime? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know hand to code. Really, it's not that hard to sharpen and take care of your knife, so I would not be worried about your cutting board being good or bad for your knife. Um, as long as you're stealing it and taking care of it and having it sharpened every once in a while, you're going to be just fine. Thoughts on putting knives in the dishwasher? Shame on you if you do. Hand wash and dry every time. If you have a nice knife, it should never touch the dishwasher. It's going to be getting rattled around with a bunch of water, and it's going to ruin the blade. Now, if it's a piece of crap knife, and you just sharpen it yourself all the time, go ahead. But if you spend $100 plus on a knife, you should definitely take care of it by hand washing it. It only takes about 30 seconds. Yeah, three-ish days for cut fruits about pushing it, for sure. If you had to use four mainstay types of pots and pans, it would almost deem mandatory for a good kitchen, which would they be? A large 10-inch saute pan, a two- or three-gallon stock pot, a normal simmering pot, and a nice sheet pan. That'd be it. How often do you steal your knife in general? 
almost every time you use it, you should be stealing it. I steal mine um, every time I use it. There's no reason not to steal it. It takes about 2.5 seconds if you get good at it. And then uh, that's it. Thank you, Frugals. Did you used to be a cook in fine dining? Um, I've certainly cooked a lot of nice food, yeah. I don't know if I'd call it true fine dining. We did some pretty extravagant stuff, uh, specifically for the one chef I work for. But yeah, Soul Six, stealing your knife is the single best way to take care of it. You can steal it after every single use. Like if you're switching from potatoes to doing something else, you can steal it in between. It'll be even better. How long does it typically take to attend and finish culinary school? My program was a two-year program, Caden. Uh, I think most culinary programs are about two years. There may be some exceptions for the like CAA and stuff like that, but restaurant management's four, apparently, I've been told. It does not wear your knife down at all, Soul Sticks. The steel, you're not pressing very hard. Think of the pressure you're using to press a button on your controller. It's a very light pressure. If you're uh, grinding away the blade with the steel, you're doing it wrong. Actually, wood's one of the safer cutting boards, Danny K. Wood has natural antibacterial properties. Granted, you probably wouldn't want to use the same wood cutting board for cutting raw chicken and then switch right over to vegetables, but uh, there's nothing wrong with a wood cutting board. Wustov's nice, Roscoe Waffle. The most important thing for a paring knife is that it... Uh, the most important thing for a paring knife is that it fits your hand well, and everybody's hands are different. Like, I have a global paring knife. I don't like it because it doesn't... Uh, it doesn't grip very well for me. It's a nice knife, though. Live in really high elevation. Is there anything you change with cooking fish? No. You just have to be uh, wary that it's going to be harder to boil water uh, in high elevation. Should not affect cooking fish at all. Monochrome XL, thanks for the support. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. I'm going to take, uh, take the stream down. We'll be back in approximately um, 10 minutes. i got to clean up real quick, and then we're going to be playing Lilith Streaks and the Binding of Isaac. Thank you all once again for making this content possible. You're all amazing. We'll catch you in just a few minutes.